Approximately 11 months ago, I released a video arguing that the initial sites being considered by Elon Musk for a colony on Mars are not the ideal locations. Not that they aren't you know, good locations for a colony, but that there was a much better option. And my argument was for SpaceX to establish their first colony in the Valles Marineris. Now, this is a location that has not been considered by the vast majority of experts who are advocating for a colony on Mars, mostly because there is no water ice there, or so it was widely believed. Now, the reason that a majority of experts Experts believe this about the Valles Marineris, and by the way, this included Elon Musk as well, is because of the equatorial location of the Valles Marineris. At this particular location, oftentimes the temperature rises above the melting point of water, and as a result, any water ice over the centuries, and indeed even eons, should have evaporated away long ago. However, the trace gas orbiter from the European Space Agency and Roscosmos has made a stunning discovery that the water reserves in the Valles Marineris, the largest and most impressive canyon in the solar system, are far, far larger than anybody suspected, except perhaps for a narrow minority of planetologists and scientists who believe that the water ice was there all along as a result of telltale signs that has been observed over the years by the various orbiters that we have keeping the red planet under observation. And as a result, this changes everything as far as the Valles Marineris is concerned and our possible plans to place a colony there. I have therefore decided to re-release an updated version of my original video that argues that this is the best location for SpaceX to place its future colony. And we're going to find out all of the details and it's a lot more than just water ice that indicate that the Valles Marineris, a place that we have woefully neglected with every single lander that we have put on Mars thus far, may be the best location by far to place a human colony for a sustainable presence on the red planet and to make the human species into a multi-planetary civilization. My name is Jordan Wright. I was born in the same year that the human race took its first steps on the surface of another world, and then we promptly betrayed those people's legacy by never going back. But now, over half a century later, there's a new breed of pioneers that are seeking to finish what these people set out to do so long ago. But there is trouble as well, so it's time for commentators like me to stop being polite and start getting angry. Now, I've talked about landing in this canyon in the past, but let's go a little bit more into detail by taking a brief tour. First, there's the East Chasma and the Caprates Chasma. Now, both of these areas are utterly colossal compared to the Grand Canyon, but still too narrow and prone to landslides for our purposes. Now, the Orphir and Candor Chasmas have extremely rough terrain, and this is also the case with the Hebus Chasma. Really, the only places that are quite viable for a landing site is the extremely wide Melis Chasma, or possibly the Juvente Chasma, which is also very large and relatively flat. 
Now, a paper entitled Landing Site and Exploration Zone in Eastern Melis or Melis Chasma, as it is sometimes called, put out by the University of Tokyo, Georgia Tech, the University of Leicester, the British Geological Survey, and others, describes this area as a favorable exploration zone for future human missions to the surface of Mars. It goes on to say that this region has the resources needed to keep humans alive, especially H2O, and a central landing site or multiple sites of at least 5 by 5 kilometers that are favorable for landing with low slopes, few meter scale hazards, and not covered by thick dust. The paper goes on to say that the region likely has ample supplies of iron, aluminum, silicon, and the silicon will be very important later on, titanium and magnesium for use in in situ construction of buildings, habitats, and other structures. However, the biggest practical advantage of the Vallis Marineris is its equatorial location along with its depth. Because it's located almost exactly on the equator, and because Mars has a 25 degree axial tilt, there are going to be some very, very brutal winters for anybody at a latitude of 30 to 40 degrees, which is where Elon has chosen his landing sites, whereas the Vallis Marineris would be on the equator and a whole lot warmer therefore requiring a lot less energy to provide heat and life support. But what about water? I mean, Elon Musk himself said that this area was unlikely to have water because of the relatively high temperatures at the Martian equator and what that would do to subsurface Martian ice. So where is the water coming from? Well, there's a phenomena called RSLs that cause long streaks to appear down the slopes of Martian valleys, and these appear on a seasonal basis and at a certain temperature. Now, some scientists argue that these are simply sand streaks. However, why would they appear seasonally, and why only at a certain temperature that coincidentally is the same temperature that would cause water to bubble to the surface? And by the way, there are quite a few of these RSLs in the Vallis Marineris, especially in the Miles Chasma. However, there are other clues of abundant water sources in the Vallis Marineris, foremost of which is the regular ice fogs that appear mostly in the morning. In a paper written by Cecilia Lung on science.gov, they found that the model temperature structure suggests that if water is well mixed and fog is present within the warmer canyon bottom, fog should be present on the cooler surrounding plateaus as well. This is generally not the case. Therefore, the only way to produce fog inside the canyon is to have a local water source. However, even if these two water signatures do not play out, it is also pointed out that there is kieserite and polyhydrated sulfates, and I may be mispronouncing that, that dominate the south-southwest half of this region, perhaps from upwelling of groundwater. This three kilometer thick deposit is dominated by polyhydrated sulfates, suggesting a significant amount of bound water, up to 50% by volume for potential in situ resource utilization. Oh, the difference that a few years make. Check out this map that was created by the Mars Odyssey Gamma Ray Spectrometer. As you can see, the Vallis Marineris shows no evidence whatsoever of H2O. None. And yet, the Trace Gas Orbiter from the ESA has demonstrated that there is a very large amount of water ice present, pretty much in the exact location where I was advocating putting a colony. Now, once again, I'm not claiming that I'm cleverer than anybody at NASA or anything like that, only that the people who put together that paper that I was referencing had the right idea, and the trace gas orbiter data proves it. 
Physicist Igor Mitrofanov, and I may be mispronouncing that, of the Space Research Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences in Russia, who is the lead author of the new study, says, quote, With the trace gas orbiter, we can look down to one meter beneath this dusty layer and see what's really going on beneath Mars' surface, and crucially locate water-rich oases that couldn't be detected with previous instruments. Friend, as it is called, revealed an area with an unusually large amount of hydrogen in the colossal Valles Marineris Canyon system. Assuming the hydrogen we see is bound into water molecules, as much as 40% of the near-surface material in this region appears to be water." Unquote. Now, by the way, FRIEND stands for the Fine Resolution Epithermal Neutron Detector, and instead of mapping light at the very surface of the red planet as previous orbiters have done, this device detects neutrons, which allows it to see the hydrogen content of Mars' soil up to a meter below the surface. Quote, Neutrons are produced when highly energetic particles known as galactic cosmic rays strike Mars. Drier soils emit more neutrons than wetter ones and so we can deduce how much water is in the soil by looking at the neutrons it emits. We found a central part of Valles Marineris to be packed full of water, far more water than we expected. This is very much like Earth's permafrost regions where water ice permanently persists under dry soil because of the constant low temperatures, unquote. And by the way, that's from physicist Alexei Malakov, who's also of the Space Research Institute. These water reserves are approximately the size of the Netherlands, an absolutely enormous resource that we could make use of if we placed a colony here. Trillions upon trillions of tons of water ice for oxygen, obviously for water, and also for rocket fuel. It makes this location completely ideal for a colony, but there are other advantages as well as you will see as we return to the video that I made almost a year ago. It would appear that this region of the Valles Marineris has everything you would need for a colony. And by the way, we're not even talking about the fact that you would be living in a canyon that could stretch from one side of the North American continent to the other and would have canyon walls as high as Mount Everest. Now, unpredictable wind shear is looked upon as one of the greatest threats to any vessel trying to land in this mammoth canyon. However, the chosen landing sites are far enough from the canyon walls to make this risk pretty moderate. And on top of that, the Martian atmosphere is so thin that even the strongest winds can be barely felt against a person's skin. That being the case, I really don't see wind shear as being a substantial threat to a massive ship like the Starship. Perhaps if it had parachutes, but it doesn't. And keep in mind, there's going to be a tremendous demand on the power provided by the solar panels that are delivered by cargo starships. It's going to take acres of solar panels just to create the necessary methyl ox fuel to make the starships fly home, assuming that we want to reuse them. And then there's powering the colony, powering communications, creating oxygen from in situ H2O, all sorts of things that you need power from the solar panels. And if you can avoid having to heat your habitat, that is a huge bonus. And in the Valles Marineris, you can get away with that, at least during the daytime. And here's how. If you wanted to build a large-scale dome, your first step would be to introduce natural bacteria that occur on Earth that eat perchlorates and produce oxygen as a byproduct. They would have a field day on Mars, assuming that they had an environment that was friendly to them, and it would be easy to provide that if you had a warm dome, at least during the daytime. And at night, it could be artificially heated. And by the way, a greenhouse using this pyramid shape could also make use of solar panels and just the natural warmth that exists in the Valles Marineris. 
And these structures could be made out of silica aerogel. Remember when I said that silicon would be important? This substance would allow the sunlight to be concentrated and warmed further, an effect that would be even more intense in the Vallis marineris and would allow photosynthesis to occur inside the dome without any artificial heating. Now, of course, at night, because of the thin Martian atmosphere, you would still need life support power. Once the perchlorates were cleansed away, creating a lot of oxygen in the process, by the way, then you would have a functional biodome, which you could use mulch to fertilize the Martian soil. This mulch would come from aeroponics or hydroponics that you had been using prior to the creation of this dome when the colony was in its early stages. Now, of course, all of this could be done just about any place else on Mars. However, it would be easier at the Vallis Marineris, number one, because of its equatorial location, and number two, because of its depth, making it one of the warmest places on the planet, a planet that is notoriously cold, so you would want that sort of advantage wherever you set up a colony. Honestly, I'm surprised not a lot of people have thought of this yet. But as the colony expands, one thing that will be definitely worth exploring will be the Noctis Labyrinthus at the far west side of the Vallis Marineris for one important reason. Well, two. For one thing, it's a fascinating area of complicated, narrow canyons, a labyrinth as it's called, but at the same time, it's probably connected to the nearby volcano of Pavonis Mons, part of its lava tube system. And if this is indeed the case, we can set up additional colonies inside the lava tubes, which probably also have water ice. So to me, this is what living on Mars is all about. A vast canyon network, almost 3,000 miles long, so enormous that I could never explore it in my lifetime, with impossibly high canyon walls, as tall as Everest, as I said before, something unlike anything that we have here on Earth. This is the sort of place that I would like to live, and this would make all the hardships of living on Mars worth it. And remember those RSLs? Well, it's thought that they contain both salt and water in abundance, which is essential to life, which means that we may be able to find alien life in all its diversity and abundance here in the Vallis Marineris. Now, of course, this wouldn't be a proper episode of The Angry Astronaut if I didn't get pissed off at some point. And I have to admit, this particular discovery actually has me as angry as I am excited, and here's why. We have ignored this canyon for such a tremendously long period of time when it comes to our landers. Now, granted, it is more dicey to try to put a lander down in a canyon system than where we've been placing our landers up to now. Although I have to say the Jezero crater is about as risky as setting a lander down in the Vallis Marineris. However, that's where we decided to put Perseverance, and in my opinion, that was the wrong place to put this particular probe for a variety of different reasons. First of all, I think the geology in the Vallis Marineris is far more diverse given the extreme depth of this canyon. Also, it's going to be far more exciting to the general public to look at images of canyon walls that tower seven to eight kilometers over a lander as opposed to relatively featureless terrain that we've been looking at from just about every lander we've put on the Martian surface up to this point. If we want people to get excited about space exploration, if we want people to get motivated to go to Mars, to explore Mars, then we have to show Mars at its 
best. And yet we haven't done that at all. We've set no landers down with inside of Olympus Mons, nor have we set any landers down inside the Valles Marineris. And given how wide this canyon is and the type of technology we have available to us today, the next lander should definitely set down there, especially in the aftermath of this discovery, because it does appear that there is as, as much water ice and potential for life, both ancient and current, in the, this amazing canyon system, the largest canyon in the solar system as there is any place else on the planet. Why are we not taking advantage of this? Why are we not exploring one of the most amazing features, the most amazing geological features that we have ever discovered in our history, as opposed to going to relatively uninteresting parts of the planet? Once again, I'm not saying that curiosity or perseverance or spirit have not discovered important things. They certainly have, but the Valles Marineris has been woefully neglected, and we need to do something about that and do something soon. And on top of that, as I said, this is a perfect location for a colony, both in terms of the relative temperature, also the density of the air, and therefore protection from radiation, and also the curiosity probe determined that locations on cliff faces, and there's a lot of those in the Valles Marineris, are shielded from radiation, making this an even better location to build a colony. On top of the sheer wonder that would fill a colonist's mind and heart if they were to see every time they woke up in the morning massive cliffs towering as high as Mount Everest. I can't imagine how exciting that will be for future colonists. If you like what I have to say, if you appreciate this type of content and you want to see more, it's all in the description. I would appreciate your support or just a like and subscribe and I will be very happy. So until we stop neglecting this fascinating and unparalleled geological feature in our solar system and explore it in earnest and also set it as one of our prime locations for a future colony. I urge all of you to stay angry about space.